So now, uh, Sneha from DigitalOcean is going to talk about how they're monitoring their Kubernetes setup. Yes, hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Awesome. So, hi, my name is Sneha Nguva. I'm from DigitalOcean. If it wasn't apparent before we use Prometheus at DigitalOcean, you guys are probably sick of seeing us here. However, today I'm going to be talking about something slightly different. Um, I'll be talking about how we leverage Prometheus and Alert Manager for both cluster monitoring and alerting. So. It's the name of my talk. Uh, oh yeah, about me again. I am a software engineer at DigitalOcean. Um, I was formerly on the team that used um, Prometheus and Alert Manager for monitoring our Kubernetes clusters. I'm still working with Prometheus and Alert Manager, but now for, um, I guess, our data center-wide uh, monitoring. So. Before I delve into exactly what we've done, I just wanted to share some stats with you. So we currently have 15 Kubernetes clusters um, in 12 data centers which are located all around the world. We have more than 300 production applications in them, generally have two Promethei. I know there's a lot of contention about the plural of that, but uh, I went with Promethei this time. <laughs> there's two Promethei and an alert manager plural cluster. We have about a million and a half time series. Um, on the aggregate, and then we're scraping about 100,000 samples a second, um, also an aggregate step. So the plan today is I'm gonna first talk about the pre-Kubernetes days uh, at DigitalOcean and how those felt. Um, then I'll talk about uh, when we started using Kubernetes at DigitalOcean, and this is something we like to call DOCC. I'm gonna talk about how we've leveraged Prometheus and Alert Manager for monitoring that. Finally, I'm going to go into some like actual examples of what we're monitoring and how we've set up alerting. And of course, no change uh, you know, happens without some friction. So I'm going to talk about potential pitfalls that we've run into and how we address them. And finally, end with my absolute favorite part of the talk, which is like my pie in the sky ideas. So, so in the pre-Kubernetes world, typically what would happen is that a service owner would write an application, um, you know, either in Go or Rails or whatnot. Um, they would provision a server using Chef or Ansible. They would then use like a CI pipeline, maybe they would use bash scripts or something else, and then they would deploy and or update their application as needed. Um, in terms of monitoring, we had, you know, Nagios, we still use it, but for host monitoring, which didn't provide too much introspection into your ap actual application. Uh, at some point, people also heavily used, um, you know, CollectD and StatsD and maybe push stuff to Graphite. I believe there was also an open TSDB cluster at some point, but this, this predates me joining the company, but I've heard rumors. <laughs> So, what were the issues with this? First of all, when using Chef, it often took way longer to actually provision your host than write the actual service. It's a very domain-specific language and had significant operational overhead, and quite often by the time people learned Chef, um, wrote a cookbook, provisioned a server, and had to come back to make a change, they would actually forget how to use it. Um, there was also the issue of black box monitoring not being too insightful and in general using uh, something like graphite was a little difficult because it didn't really work well. It wasn't too multidimensional and it was the, the querying language wasn't that great. So in general, they knew a change had to be made, which led us to Digital Ocean Command Center, aka DOCC. Very original naming, I know, but um, basically it's a tool for deploying containerized stateless applications. So DOCC is actually um, an abstraction layer on top of Kubernetes, and I'm not too sure how familiar all of you are with Kubernetes, but it's basically a container orchestration tool from Google. And the idea in Kubernetes is that you have a bunch of worker nodes, and then the smallest primitive um, is typically, or I guess one of the most important primitives is referred to as a pod, which consists of a bunch of containers deployed alongside each other, which can communicate with each other. Um, the control plane consists of the controller manager, which runs this reconciliation loop to check the current state of the cluster and the expected state, and kind of pushes state towards the expected state. There's also the scheduler, which is responsible for scheduling the actual pods onto our worker nodes, or kubelets, as uh, they're properly called. And then there's the API server, which we actually leverage for DOCC, which is essentially an API in how the different uh, components within the cluster communicate with each other. There's a lot more technical details, and like I'm not even going to go into that, because we could spend like the next week discussing that. 
But just know, you know, that is what Kubernetes is. So DOCC is um, what uh, my colleagues and I chose to build, which is an abstraction layer on top of Kubernetes. We decided to go with this to kind of um, basically have only a subset of features that are exposed to our end users, uh, as well as like it would give us the ability to add certain uh, features as well. So DOCC, basically a command line interface that users would use to communicate with um, GSCC server, which would leverage the Kubernetes API and create pods by uh, creating another primitive known as a daemon set, as well as another primitive, which I really haven't gone into, which is the service, which is kind of a way that you can group pods together. So in a post-DOCC world, things were significantly simplified. What would happen is a service owner would write an application. They would typically dockerize their application. They would then describe their application in a declarative JSON manifest file and then just simply deploy it. Um, so the massive change was that deployments and updates took minutes, uh, not hours. I believe we had a hackathon during which people like deployed like 100 applications onto our clusters and it was significantly easier than uh, writing Chef. On top of that, you can use DOCC to view running applications, get application logs, you know, scale, update, delete, what have you. Um, this brings us to monitoring. So when we decided to move over to Kubernetes clusters, there's a question of how we would monitor. And uh, well, naturally, Prometheus and Alert Manager already used a DigitalOcean, but beyond that, they work really well with Kubernetes for various reasons. I mean, first of all, they're really easy to deploy. You can Dockerize and deploy both of them uh, just as like pods. Um, on top of that, there's Kubernetes service discovery built in, which was very helpful. Um, there's also the whole like multi-dimensional model, very helpful when you're dealing with pods uh, that could be scaled. Um, so a lot of reasons that we decided to go with these. So this is our current setup. Um, essentially, we've deployed Prometheus alongside a small sidecar service known as PromConfig within a pod. We've done the same thing with Alert Manager. We've deployed it alongside something called Alert Config, also in a pod. And uh, basically, the two containers can communicate over localhost, and I'm going to show you how we actually leverage them. So now, uh, in order to actually set up monitoring for your application, what you would typically do is you would instrument your application, maybe use the Prometheus Go client or what have you, um, expose your metrics endpoint, uh, then actually specify all the details in your JSON manifest file. You'd indicate which metrics endpoint you want scraped, um, which port needs to be exposed. You would also specify the uh, alerting rule, um, specify the duration, and then we also like exposed, uh, you could specify where you wanted your alerts to go. And in our case, we just limited ourselves to Slack and PagerDuty. Then you would use the CLI to deploy your application. Uh, DOCC server would communicate with the Kubernetes API, create pods, and then create the service primitive, which I had mentioned before. What I didn't mention is that the service primitive has something uh, known as annotations, and that's where we're actually storing the, um, uh, the Prometheus rules, as well as the alert manager, like route and receiver information. So Prometheus itself um, would just talk to the Kubernetes API as part of the service discovery mechanism and then grab the metrics endpoint and port information. Uh, PromConfig, which is a sidecar that was deployed alongside Prometheus, would also talk to the Kubernetes API server, but would actually check the service primitive, grab the uh, rules information, rewrite the rules files, and then restart Prometheus. Um, alert config also behaved in a similar manner, it would communicate with the Kubernetes API server, um, basically check the uh, service annotations, grab the relevant route and receiver information, rewrite the alert manager uh, config file, and restart it. So this kind of brings us to what exactly were we monitoring? We obviously set all of this up. Um, and you know, for the longest time, I think there was definitely some confusion. And people generally would just use the up metric. But obviously, Prometheus is significantly more powerful than that. So eventually, we came to the conclusion, and people started leveraging more metrics. And so there's obviously the full four golden signals um, in the Google SRE book, if no one's read that. Yeah, you should. It's a pretty good book, um, which are used to, um, which are especially helpful for like request-based uh, services. So, for example, if you have like a, I don't know, like a small server deployed on DOCC and you wanted to measure um, perhaps latency, like how long a request to your service is taking, maybe the amount of traffic your service is getting, maybe the error rate 
or uh, the fullness of your service or saturation. There's, all, there's also the RED um, acronym, which is essentially a subset of the four golden signals. <coughs> we also leveraged um, uh, Prometheus to monitor the cluster itself, not just the services that were running in our cluster. And so for that, we leveraged the useful metrics, which is a joke I've been waiting to make all week. But sadly, no one seems to find it funny aside from me, but that's OK. <laughs> um, so utilization, saturation, and error. So saturation and error, fairly similar to before, except now we're actually monitoring uh, cluster resources. Utilization, we wanted to check you know, how much work um, is a particular cluster resource doing. So if we look at very particular, oh, oh. Before I jump to that, before I look at particular examples, just to remind you the four base uh, Prometheus metrics types, I'm going to talk about how we've leveraged these plus particular uh, PromQL functions in order to measure our full golden signals and our useful metrics. So putting it all together, great. So here's one example of something that is an actual uh, something that we're currently monitoring for. Um, so one thing I didn't mention, another component of our Kubernetes architecture is an ingress load balancer. So you need some way for your um, services outside your cluster to communicate with services inside your cluster. In our case, we leveraged HAProxy and used it as an ingress load balancer. So what you'll notice here is we're basically using this base counter type. And then we're um, applying labels to like check for the amount of like bytes to a particular backend, and backend in our case is referring to a particular service that's deployed in our cluster. We're applying the rate function to it, and then aggregating across all backends. This should give us like traffic to the service Neptune. Um, and here's an example of something. So that was like one of the services particularly running in the cluster in terms of cluster. Uh, utilization, in terms of cluster resources themselves, one thing that we definitely measure is cluster CPU utilization. So in this case, we're also using a counter metric and applying a rate to get the number of like CPU cores that we're utilizing, and then like, I guess essentially dividing it by the total available CPU cores. So how are we alerting? So for the previous four golden signals and our useful metrics, uh, Pretty much just threshold alerts. So do any of these metrics exceed, uh, exceed um, a lower or upper bound? So with CPU, our, for example, are more than 80% of CPU cores being utilized? This is fairly helpful. And then we definitely use this for memory utilization as well in order to determine if we need to scale the cluster up or down. Um, State-based alerts is how we refer to um, alerts such as this, like, is my service up and scrapable? And I guess something to note is that we've also used the absent metric here, because there were numerous times when people would deploy service to DOCC, and it would actually not successfully deploy, but no alert would go off because the target was never added. So we also leveraged that. So this brings me to common pitfalls. As you can see, we've, you know, we've set up this pretty nifty monitoring solution. We've leveraged all our alerting and monitoring, but we, of course, ran into unfortunate pitfalls. So first of all, with alerting fatigue, that is an actual Slack conversation with me where I was testing the system and paged myself so many times I missed relevant pages. So this aside, this has happened a couple of times, and we've realized the best way to, in our case, one way that we've combated this is by leveraging Slack and PagerDuty. So we generally advise people to, before they promote something to like a production level alert first, test it out with just Slack before they get paged like 50 times overnight. Um, on top of that, there's of course a lot of different PromQL queries you can use and try to get your metrics to be a little less spiky. So have less false alerts. Um, there's also, uh, huge confusion around who owned what, and I think this was probably a much larger issue in the pre-DOCC days. So if an alert necessarily went off or someone was paged, no one would know who was essentially responsible for that service because after five years, there's like a lot of um, small services at the company. However, with uh, DOCC, we have a very opinionated manifest file. Um, so the service owner basically has to include a maintainer email in the manifest file, which informs us which team is actually responsible for the service. On top of that, the alerts themselves will have you know, descriptions and summaries, which will inform them exactly uh, what is happening. Um, and then this is something we actually implemented recently where we no longer will allow users to send alerts to 
our, like our internal like Kubernetes team, they have to send them to team specific PagerDuty services or team specific uh, Slack channels. Of course, there's a concept of meta monitoring, which has been you know fairly uh, contentious, and people have asked us about this from day one. Like, well, who monitors your monitors? What happens if your monitoring system goes down and you get nothing? And you think everything's been okay for like a week, which happened at some point, unfortunately. Um, in this case, you know, of course, there you typically would run uh, duplicate Promethei, and this is something we want to implement, but we haven't quite uh, implemented the high availability alert manager. Um, on top of that, there's the concept of a dead man switch, which we haven't implemented for our Kubernetes clusters, but we have implemented for our uh, data center wide uh, scraping. So in this case, you could just have an always firing alert. Um, you can send it to alert manager and then perhaps use like the webhook URL receiver and then either use something like dead man snitch or in our case, I built a little service called crybaby, which would receive this uh, log a line and then we could use something like a last alert to like check for flat lines of log lines. And we can actually use this to determine um, you know, exactly which instance of Prometheus went down. So this, this brings me to my final component, which is my pie in the sky ideas, which really is the stuff that keeps me up at night that really excites me. Um, so first of all, automated alerts. I kind of shared with you some of the stats behind our clusters, but I, I at least personally still feel like we could do better and we could definitely have um, way more threshold alerts on a lot of our services. So something I thought about um, was why even put the, the burden on you, well, I mean, we should, still should put the burden on users, but we could take away a little bit of the burden by perhaps checking the memory and CPU limits that they have to define in their manifest file. So something I didn't mention is that our DOCC manifest file required users to define some resource limits. So one thing I had thought of was, you know, if someone deploys their service, just leverage those CPU limits and automatically set up threshold alerts based on that. Um, I also thought about automatic state-based alerts, but uh, that would probably be a little bit harder than simply just grabbing information from the declarative manifest file. Something else I'm really excited about, which was a concept that I think Tim Hawken introduced at KubeCon last year, was the idea of autopilot. So often, especially if it's a first-time service, users have no idea how much they're going to consume. Um, and they're going to have like a lot of trouble de de like determining their resource limits. So why even ask them to? Why not instead just like collect metrics over time, build some sort of model, and then ourselves we could adjust limits and alerts accordingly based on that. And the final idea I had was the, the idea of auto-scaling. Um, so auto-scaling the cluster itself, there's definitely been a few times where I'm like on the subway and I'm starting to get alerts on my phone that were like 80% memory utilization, 90% for each subway stop, but I can't do anything and I'm sitting there helplessly looking at my phone. But let's avoid those situations entirely by just um, leveraging uh, our metrics and our alerting to like auto scale our entire cluster up and down as needed. Um, additionally, as I mentioned before, we have the ingress load balancers, so the same idea could be used. We could check the number of front end and back end connections, check for saturation, and then accordingly adjust. Um, we could also you know, horizontally scale services um, in a similar way. So, uh, this actually went a little faster than I thought, but um, so we're basically in this brave new world of container orchestration at DigitalOcean. Not all of our services have been migrated over, but there's like a lot of long running services where it's been very appropriate and very helpful to use uh, Kubernetes. We've, um, we also love Prometheus and Alert Manager, both for you know data center monitoring and cluster monitoring. And if there's anything that you've taken away from this whole talk, I hope, is that in this like whole new world of like the CNCF and whatnot, there's a lot of extensibility. There's a lot of, uh, you, with Kubernetes especially, you can definitely build your own abstraction on top of it and kind of do the same uh, with Prometheus. So really just take these components and make them your own. So thank you. Thank you, Sneha. So questions? So I have um, two questions. I'll start off maybe with just the first one. Mm -hmm. um, so DOCC, is that like a wrapper around basically um, 
the API server of Kubernetes? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily call it a wrapper as much as just a service that uh, communicates with the API server and then like uses it to generate primitives. So new. my question is, I was recently talking to one of the CoreOS guys who's mm -hmm. working on Tectonic, and one of the things that I found really interesting is that they're actually leveraging the API server by introducing new primitives for their own purposes. And I'm just wondering if you've ever considered that. Yeah, we definitely have done that. Um, I def I didn't mention it here, but we've, uh, I think we have a blog post out about this as well. We've um, used like the third party resources and then we've set up automated TLS in some ways. So we created like a custom third party resource to do that. So definitely leverage that. It's very helpful. Okay, so there's a blog post about this. There is a blog post about this. I will tweet it. <laughs> yeah. And if uh, Lorenz could get ready, please. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk. Awesome stuff. Yeah. I'm not sure if you were around yesterday at the Lightning Talks, but I essentially presented a solution for the number two of your goals, future goals. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. the... but we might want to talk. Yes, definitely, afterward. One of your colleagues uh, presented probably two years ago or one year ago, uh, Vulcan. Yes, I knew I was going to get this question. So <laughs> with Vulcan, um, so it, it exists, but I think unfortunately uh, we aren't necessarily maintaining it at the current time. But I think with the remote, that this is particularly why we are really interested in the remote uh, write API. We, we definitely want long-term storage, but we didn't necessarily um, have like the time or resources to continue to maintain Vulcan. Okay, so... All of this Prometheus error as stock, right? What you yeah, yeah. So, so within the Kubernetes cluster, we haven't run into the same scaling issues that one would theoretically run into with like data center wide scraping. Okay, world. thank yeah. you. That was a great talk. Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, alert routing. So, um, if um, a service that runs in Kubernetes is alerting, how do you know which team or which people to route the alerts to? Do you pull yeah. that from the manifest file? Or? Yes. So in the manifest file, I, I didn't want to like have a gigantic JSON blob because it's huge. But in the manifest file, people actually have to include their maintainer information or like their actual team email. And then on top of that, we don't allow them to like they they won't actually be able to deploy their manifest file unless they spe like specify um, a specific ch Slack channel or PagerDuty service that is just for their team. Okay, and how do you tie that information into uh, into Alert Manager? Is it using like the the service name? Uh, yeah, so basically an alert, so, so alert config will actually uh, read from the service annotations. So when we, so when they deploy, they create like their daemon set, which creates the pods, and then they create a service. And the service annotations contain all the information, including like the alerting roles, as well as like the Slack channel name, the PagerDuty service name, and alert manager will grab both of those. And then basically write, um, rewrite the configuration to include like the custom routes and like the receivers that that corresponds to. And then like, do if there's any duplications in there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, up here. Here. Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm looking um, over there. So uh, regarding uh, autopilot and autoscaling yes. within the cluster, there's actually some really cool things happening um, around the core and custom metrics API, oh, really? okay. which have been introduced recently in 1.8, mm -hmm. 1.7. 1. Yeah. Um, which will... Uh, allow us to do all of those things, and Prometheus is actually the first adapter for that. So. Really? Okay, that's very um, exciting. Yeah. Hey. Um, you had this PromConf uh, sidecar. Um, yep. Why didn't you use like the standard rewriting? <laughs> it, oh, wait, was no. it not sufficient for you? or? Um, I think at the time, so I discovered that this existed yesterday, so I think at the time, unfortunately, we did, this was like, this was built like maybe earlier this year. I actually don't even know where you are or where I should be looking. But oh, you're over there. Okay, sorry. Yeah. That would be very helpful. Um, uh, yeah. So this this was built like way earlier this year, or towards the end of last year. Um, so I think at the time we unfortunately didn't know. But I I realized this existed yesterday and was like, if only I had known. Well, it's mind twisting uh, oh, yeah. at some point. So yeah. maybe it's easier to write a sidecar. That's yeah. <laughs> that well. <laughs> Uh, super interesting, but how long did it take to go from the old world to the new? Sounds like a um, super long, uh, big change. I think so. When I joined the team, it was like April of last year, and I think they had come out with like the super alpha version, and we're just getting feedback. I think maybe between like their super alpha version and getting like 
300 services on it. That was like towards the end of last year. So it was probably seven to eight months. But I think um, what really... Super fast. Yeah, it's pretty... I mean, I think uh, the previous way was not fun at all to use. And then on top of that, um, my manager at the time had basically like gone to team by team and started with like the most receptive team to try to like onboard them individually. So like... Super. Thanks. thanks. Anyone else have a question? Well, thanks you very much. See you. Thank you.